the law, you shape the nature of the community. Its morals, its mores are reflected in the criminal law. So if you want to be living in a certain type of state that doesn't have gambling, that doesn't do this, that, and the other thing, you can go to that kind of state. Maybe boring, but you can go elsewhere if you don't like it. You can go to Vegas. You can go elsewhere. That's the nature of a federal system because it allows for different types of community to, to coexist. When you move that federal that, that police power generally to the federal level, what happens is that you get the attempt to make uniform and you ultimately politicize criminal law. Think of the abortion area, for instance. Depending on the administration, either they're enforcing the FACE Act, which is the Freedom of Access to Clinics Act, or they're enforcing the Partial Birth Abortion Statute. It's a political fight. We've taken issues that belong at the state and we've moved them to the federal level. Separation of powers. The lawmaking power is supposed to be in Congress. You would never know it because even though we have no uh, common law crimes at the federal level, the statutes are so vaguely written that it leaves it to judges to articulate what the meaning of the statute is. Long ago, Chief Justice Marshall said in the Wilberger case, the reason for the principle of strict construction is not just criminal, it is a matter of separation of powers. It is a matter for the Congress to write the statutes clearly, not for us to rewrite them. One, uh, on the executive level, something that's not well known is that members of the Justice Department basically write the federal criminal laws. In opposition to the Bush administration, the Congress, namely some Republicans, insisted that the administration continue to detail members of the Justice Department to the criminal justice committees in the House and the Senate. So if you go in to lobby your member there who happens to be on that committee, you ought to ask, are you really employed by the Justice Department or are you really employed by the Congress? It is the most fundamental violation of separation of powers you can have. The courts, look, Republicans are all against overactive activist judges, right? Except when it comes to federal criminal law. Whether it's a Democratic administration or a Republican administration, the Justice Department is always pushing the envelope. Just look at the mail fraud cases. The reality is we do not have separation of powers when it comes to federal criminal law. Very few members of Congress will vote against it. And what does that mean? As all the founders, both Federalists and Anti-Federalists understood, when you do not have separation of powers, you have the very definition of tyranny. The practical side. It is often said, well, wait a minute, you know, there are all of these statutes, but we really don't use them. We use the mail fraud statute, we use a few other things. Well, wait a minute, what are the things they focus on? Guns. Wait a minute, that's a local violent crime issue. And until 1980, nobody thought that, until Arlen Specter uh, put forth his first bill on this, nobody thought the federal government had jurisdiction over this, except in terms of dealing with guns crossing state lines. How about drugs? Yes, the federal government has an authority over the transportation of drugs if they can get them from state to state and over our borders. I don't dispute that, but where do they put their focus? At least in a Republican administration, not under this administration. A lot of it is on local drug crimes that really ought not to concern the federal government. Immigration, yeah, right. Wish they would spend more time on immigration. But the real one is, quote, corruption, okay? This is where they use the mail fraud statute. What is it? A lot of this is local petty corruption. Does the federal government have a role in corruption? Yes, it does. The problem is it doesn't do it. They say if we don't do it, these local politicians who are corrupt will continue to be elected. Yes, but if you've ever been in a situation like I've been in, challenging an election where you knew there was fraud, try to get a U.S. attorney to actually investigate it. And why won't they? Because they are subject, not so much to the president, but to the senators in their state. And boy, they don't want to offend them. Thank you very much. Hello, all. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking all of you, especially our event organizers, for organizing such a wonderful conference, uh, especially a shout out to Colin White who's been support, for printing out my stuff and taking me all around. Um, and also a shout out to our Hoyas. We have 15 Hoyas here, 
So, so Donna, Tamara, sorry, um, Georgetown, Trump's Vermont, in terms of numbers traveled. All right, I propose to begin by giving you the facts that support those who argue that over-federalization is not a problem. And here, um, I'm using a, an article recently by Susan Klein in Emory Law Journal. What I hope to show is there are certain facts we don't disagree about, and the question is really, what are the implications of the facts? Um, everyone agrees that there's no definitive count possible, actually, of the federal criminal code. The latest count is 4,000, but no one actually knows how many count, how many uh, statutes we have. This is in part because Congress regularly delegates to agencies to promulgate uh, regulations and then prospectively says, and when you, re when you issue them, they will be criminally enforceable. So there are some estimates that are, there are actually hundreds of thousands of criminally enforceable regulations in every agency across the government. Um, there has been an explosion in this legislation, obviously. Now, those who argue that this isn't a problem point out that despite this, the allocation of federal and state law enforcement has been stable principally for a, a decade, uh, sorry, a century. So today, 5% of all criminal cases are federal, 95% are states, and that's been pretty constant for 100 years. Um, they also say that you know resource constraints means the federal government can only do so much. And most importantly, that 80% of all cases, federal cases, fall into just four offense categories, drugs, immigration, guns, and fraud. And that too has been relatively stable. And in fact, in 2011, 59% of federal cases fell into two categories, 30% drug cases and 30% immigration cases. Um, so, so people argue also the regulatory violations, these hundreds of thousands of regulations, many of which don't carry any significant mens rea requirements, and we all kind of object to them, I think. Um, these have gone down from 7% of the federal docket to 2% recently. So, there, so the argument basically, also, 95% or more of all federal criminal cases plead out. In 2011, the plea rate was 97.4%, um, which I think is a pretty shocking number. So in reliance on these figures, those who argue that we don't have an over-federalization problem basically say that the overabundance of federal legislation is not a problem because prosecutors basically ignore most of it, right? <laughs> they just bring a certain number of cases and that's it. Um, second, uh, that um, they concede there are problems with the lack of mens rea in, in, in um, sorry, regulatory offenses and the vagueness referred to by Professor Baker. Um, but they say, you know, judges can clean that up. So it's fine. And finally, they say the plea rate and the scarce resources ensure, basically reflect the prosecutors are being very efficient, right? They're only bringing the strongest, most worthy cases, so we really don't need to worry about it. This is the problem, so do we have a problem? I think so, all right? First, the premise is that there's no cost to abundant um, regulations and statutes out there if they're not being enforced. I disagree. As, as Professor Baker said, statutes are supposed to embody a stigma, right? This is supposed to be, you can destroy a life by prosecuting someone, right? It's supposed to carry a moral stigma. If it's silly or under-enforced, you totally undermine the force, the moral force of the criminal law, which is central to its, to its credibility. Um, second of all, you know, Congress, everybody agrees, what Congress does is a problem arises and it says, well, okay, let's criminalize it. That's why we have so many statutes. There is no political cost to voting for yet another crime or upping the penalty on another crime. Well, the problem is that's not an answer to most problems. Right? It allows Congress off the hook, it gives us more unenforced statutes, but it doesn't respond to the underlying problem. Also, the disorganized, incoherent nature of the code makes it very difficult to work with it. So, for example, we didn't know that assassination of a president was not a federal crime until President Kennedy was shot. We didn't know what the purposes of federal punishment are, which is central to, to figuring out what sentence is appropriate until 1986 when Congress, ooh, I'm sorry, we should probably have some purposes. The code is also totally inefficient. If you look, for example, at obstruction, 
There have been a, a number of cases that have gone up to the Supreme Court lately, and the courts reversed the conviction because you know the obstruction uh, statutes are so sprawling and incoherent. The prosecutors, unless you spend weeks looking at them, you're going to pick the wrong code section, and they did, wasting enormous amounts of resources. The incoherence of this code also breeds normative problems. So, the penalty for um, the maximum penalty for fleeing enforcement agents of the INS at excessive speed and possession of depiction of animal cruelty with the intention to distribute for commercial gain, five years, is the same as the penalty for female genital mutilation of women under 18. Strikes me is that's a real problem, but you wouldn't know it if you have over 5,000 statutes to look at. All right, so most important, as Professor Baker pointed out, this prolix code gives prosecutors enormous power. And they can go after almost anybody for almost anything. Um, and the problem is exacerbated by the vagueness of many of these prohibitions. So I'm just going to explain what we're talking about by honest services really quickly. I think we're all going to refer to it. Honest services. So there is no, believe it or not, federal statute that addresses generally state and co local corruption. It's not a crime to bribe the state legislature on the federal level, but prosecutors want to go after these people. So what they do, they press into service a fraud statute, mail fraud and wire fraud. And basically what they said was, you, citizenry, have a right to the honest services of your representatives, state, local, and federal. Right? And if somebody bribes you, they have deprived the citizenry of the right to your honest services as a public official. And if you don't tell the citizens, that's fraud. Okay? So, for 46 years, unanimous courts of appeals endorsed this. People went to jail regularly. It was also expanded to encompass private actors. This is why everybody is, uh, well, maybe not the Hoyas, but everybody else is probably <laughs> guilty of honest services fraud. So if I am a private, work for a private employer, and the private employer tells me I may not use my phone or my computer for private purposes, and I buy a great pair of shoes on eBay, that is a violation of my duty of honest services under some of this case law. If I don't disclose it, I have committed a 20-year federal felony. Now, obviously, that gives me a lot of discretion as a prosecutor. If I identify somebody I don't like, it's pretty easy to make a case, right? So what happened? Um, so what's problematic about this? Well, obviously, the discretion gives prosecutors. Those who say this isn't a problem argue, well, judges will take care of it. My response is, no offense. This is not a job for judges, right? There's a reason we have separation of powers. There's a reason why um, under our scheme, let uh, popularly elected Congress people are supposed to dictate the terms of criminal sanctions, right? These judges are not electorally accountable, and they're not well situated to know the scope of the problem, to understand all the policy issues underlying it, and to identify a credible line between guilty and innocent. So, um, also, it's just a problem. Common law adjudication has a terrible cost in human suffering. Um, now, you may not feel sorry for everybody who's been prosecuted. We'll probably get to this later. The, the idea that they're bad people, so who cares, right, which is a common argument, I don't buy in part because of the vagueness of the statute and its over inclusibility. But in any case, I think we'd all agree that for 46 years, people went to jail. Right? For honest services fraud. And then, after 46 years, the Supreme Court said, oh, that's not a crime. No apology, just that's not a crime. So all those people who had gone to jail were let out. You know, the, their lives had been destroyed, but, you know, it wasn't a crime. So then Congress decided, oh, we're going to have to overrule McNally, this opinion, and reinstate a statute that said honest services, I mean, sorry, fraud includes the deprivation of honest services. That was the whole statute. Okay, I, I think I can wrap this up. So what happened then? 20 years, the courts of appeals struggled with the statute mightily. 
splits all over the place to try and define what honest services meant, to try and come up with some rational way, again, to distinguish between something that you could go to jail for 20 years for and, and innocent conduct. Are my shoes in or out, basically, right? And so what happens? They disagree, it goes up to the Supreme Court. What does the Supreme Court do? It says, yeah, the statute is, is unconstitutionally vague, but we're going to fix it. It now only applies to kickbacks and bribes. You've had another 20 years of lots and lots of people going to jail, right, for something that turned out was not a crime. In my view, right, the, the, the cost of freedom, the ability to plan your life, the ability to understand that which is going to subject you to criminal sanction, the worst thing our society can do to you, really demands that there's advanced specification by Congress and that judges should, as, as wonderful as they are and as well-meaning as they are, because, you know, the, the honest services statute was referred to as a dog's breakfast by some of these judges, and they were trying mightily because they knew Congress wasn't going to do any better, but yet it's not their job. So, in, in short, that's my response um, to the those who think over-federalization is not a problem, and I look forward to those um, to the rebuttal of those who believe it really isn't. Thank you. So good morning. I, uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, Colin White and uh, I know uh, some of uh, my own students are in the audience and uh, uh, are excited about being in Austin. We are talking about uh, barbecue and beef rib locations a few minutes ago. I encourage you all to uh, to explore Austin a little bit. Um, you know, I want to sort of back up a minute and, and really try to isolate two different issues that I think are going on in this discussion. One uh, issue is uh, frustration with over-criminalization in society as a whole. Um, do we like the way the criminal laws are going? Do we like the, the way that legislators in, whether at the state or federal level, are enacting criminal laws? And a second issue has to do with the balance of power between federal and state criminal systems. Um, and, and, and I think the discussions are being intertwined uh, between those two issues. So going to the first issue, do we like the way criminalization is going? Um, the fact is, as a society, we are increasingly criminalizing behavior. Uh, the increase in criminal laws is not limited to the federal level. It is limited to the state level. I am not saying that's a good thing. In fact, I think it's a bad thing. Um, but you are seeing it both at the federal and the state level. So, um, you know, you have, you know, the, the, the classic boy for vagueness cases. Um, there's one case that comes out of Jacksonville it's a state, you know, it was either a state or, or local ordinance that made it unlawful uh, to wander or stroll around from place to place without any lawful purpose. Loafing, strolling, wandering from place to place. Those are classic boy for vagueness um, statutes, and you see that, you know, you see that at the civil level, you see that at the criminal level, and, and they've been struck down again and again, but you see that happening coming out of state legislatures. You also see it coming out of the federal system. Um, so, so we talked a little bit, and Professor O'Sullivan and, uh, talked a little bit about the honest services fraud. I actually prosecuted several honest services cases. Um, in each case, I, I saw the statute, and, and to be honest, it sent shivers down my back. Because if a federal prosecutor can decide what is honest services, that is really, really scary for me sitting as a federal prosecutor. So one of the things that, that I set forth very early on when we use it, we are going to use it in a classic case where a public official takes money in return for a particular selling of the vote. Uh, takes um, uh, $200,000 from a yacht club, yacht club forgave $2,000 in dockage fees in return for uh, voting to change some property owned by uh, the yacht club from a non-commercial to a commercially zoned piece of land. Um, that is sort of a classic honest services. Uh, we made sure that it violated local law. We made sure that there was an exchange of hands. And in fact, when there was one local politician that publicly announced that they would vote in favor of something if the person to benefit paid X hundred thousand dollars to their favorite charity, 
uh, while I was kind of shocked at the public selling of the vote, uh, my view was let the voters vote that person out of office. Uh, but no, they did not. Um, um, because that, you can't say you know, that, that that's fraud because it was very out of the public. So, so the statutes that give prosecutors discretion exist at the state level, exist at the federal level. I am not saying that that discretion should necessarily exist and void for vagueness is an issue, but that is not unique to the federal system. Uh, would it be better for Congress to simply pass an anti-corruption statute that's more explicit? Absolutely. But that's what prosecutors have. Um, so, so with, with that said, I, I, I want to, and, and, and let, me, let me just say, one of my concerns with the Skilling case was that all the corrupt public officials that we put in jail the right way would then go out because I was very upset when it was charged the way it was charged because I thought it endangered the entire statute and all the rightful prosecutions coming out of that. Um, fortunately, that did not happen, um, but um, it was the case that, that judges sort of read a, a more narrow meaning into the statute. Um, so let me, let me then try to move toward what I think is the federalism issue, the, the balance of power between federal and state laws. And I, I think you see that in two contexts. First is the criminalization resulting from the regulatory state. Um, we see this in the, the growth of uh, criminal laws that lack mens rea requirements. The growth of criminal laws that, that really are about criminalizing regulatory violations, moving regulatory violations from the civil to the criminal. And that is directly associated with the growth of the regulatory state. So the issue there is until the regulatory state is controlled, you're not going to change criminalization at the federal level of those statutes. Uh, the criminalization follows from the growth of the regulatory state. And so the real issue is the regulatory state. Do we want federal environmental enforcement at the level that we have it? If we are going to continue that way, the criminal laws are going to follow. So let's stop talking as much about the criminal laws and start talking about the, the, the you know, which is a symptom, and let's talk, talk about the actual problem, which is the growth of the regulatory state. You get that under control, and the laws that criminalize that fall out. The second type of law that, that affects the balance between the state and the federal government has more to do with the traditional types of state laws. Um, the, the use of gun laws, for example, to prosecute local, uh, you know, lo local criminals. And um, you know, this is a really hard issue, uh, uh, an actual story. I woke up one day when I was Swiss attorney, the front page of our paper had the pictures of 20 some, I think either 24 or 28 little kids that had been shot. They, uh, one kid was in a car seat, a stray bullet went through a wall, went through a car door, killed this kid. Um, uh, what happened was the, the gangs armed up, they got AK-47s and they were doing what they call prey and spray. You start and you, you, you start with an automatic weapon and you just spray to the right and down and you pray that you hit the person. The problem is that bullets go through walls, two walls, three walls, and hit kids. Um, these are all felons. These are all felons with three priors. Um, so the question is, as federal law enforcement, do we prosecute these gangs that are just going out there um, and tearing up a neighborhood? Or do we say, this is entirely a local issue, let the locals take care of it? And that's a very, very difficult decision at a theoretical level, but at a practical level, you just don't want kids murdered, you know? And, and if you have a three-time felon or a four-time felon or a five-time felon that is going out there shooting up little kids, that person should be in jail. The federal system has the resources. The state system does not. That's the way it is. So state prosecutors have two to 300 cases. Federal prosecutors have five. State systems are overburdened. The federal resources are ATF, FBI. Um, you can really bring a lot of resources to bear. And so at a practical level, the question is, do you allow society to be shot up? Or do you say, this might not be the ideal way of doing it, but we've got to get it done now. And um, to some extent, I, I should say, I actually went out and I started, you know, picking up 
those folks and, and putting them in jail. And, and that probably weakened law enforcement, local law enforcement further, because once they start relying on the federal system, then they're going to get fewer resources and shift their own resources at the local level. And you get into a horrible feedback cycle where local law enforcement becomes less and less effective because they're relying more and more. It's kind of like a muscle. If you don't use it, if you don't work out with it, it gets weaker and weaker. If any of you have had a cast on, after a while you take the cast off and the muscles, you know, not used to, to working anymore. Um, and that's a real problem. And so the issue that we have is how do we go about addressing it? Because we can't get rid in the snap of a finger of all these you know, of, of, of federal enforcement of these types of laws because real people will die. Um, and, and so there has to be a way to sort of step back and figure out how do you empower local DAs? Because the local district attorney is going to know their community a lot better than the US attorney will. The local district attorney is in a better position to enforce these laws. But the local district attorney does not have the resources, the money goes to Washington. The local district attorney does not have, um, the, the, the local police would much rather work with the, with the federal system because our, our system is more efficient at the federal level. At the federal level, our system carries higher sentences because local legislatures have not for the past several years been in the position of having to take a real look at their criminal system and keep up because the federal system has always provided a safety valve. If it's not working at the state, then the feds will take care of it. And so we put ourselves in quite a predicament on these laws because is it the case that with each passing year, the U.S. attorney becomes more of a local law enforcer? Yes, it is. Um, but are we willing to say that in order to empower the state system, we should just walk away and let people die? No, we're not. So we can talk about this at events like this and on panels like this, but we're talking about this at a theoretical question of federalism and where we really need to talk about it, the kinds of discussions we really need to have are if we believe that we want to empower the local district attorneys, how do we return to them the resources that they need? How do legislatures enact and modernize the criminal laws so that they can prosecute them? How are the local state systems changed so that they can work more efficiently? And how do the courts get more local judges so they can actually try the cases at the local level? Thank you. will help contain other sprawl, but they won't be rolling it back. 
What I would like to address instead is the growing number of federal statutes that impose criminal punishment without requiring the government to prove bad intent. The most obvious problem with intent optional federal crimes is not that they are federal, but that they are crimes at all. They break, they break the link between punishment and intentional misbehavior, a link that most normal people, not to mention the founder's generation, thought indispensable to the government's authority, legitimately to impose criminal punishment. The breaking of this link is not as novel as you might think, however. It's just the flip side of a coin minted, minted many decades ago, and that unwisely the law has come increasingly to accept. The head side of, it, of this coin is our hand-wringing hesitation to actually impose punishment for bad behavior. The hesitation takes root in all manner of psychobabble excuses and in the view that criminals are really victims, victims of the latest manufactured brain syndrome or forces like racism, capitalism, bourgeois culture, the 1%, and the other usual suspects. This zombie-like, volition-free view of criminals and crime has been in vogue since at least the 60s. What we are seeing now is the tail side of the same coin. Being reluctant to impose consequences on bad behavior, we will now take the next logical step and affirmatively impose them on good behavior, such as producing useful stuff like energy or farming on your own land. One nifty way to justify criminal sanctions for such conduct is, the ex is to exile the rule of intent. The dominant voices in the culture, in academia, the press, and Hollywood have been doing just that for years. When the importance or even the existence of personal responsibility has been hectored off the reservation of criminal law, we should scarcely be surprised to find that the space it used to occupy is now empty and ready to be filled by something else. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the good part. The bad part is that there's a more immediate outcropping of the problem, illustrated by the current demand for federal gun control legislation. It's a demand that reflects, one, a juvenile, and two, a diversionary view of law, a view you will not be surprised to hear that also, very quietly, depends on ignoring intent. It's juvenile because it examines behavior only superficially, and without reflection. There was an outrageous crime, the Sandy Hook massacre, the crime to do something, and the reflexive resort to pushing for more federal statutes without any serious questioning whether the absence of statutes is the problem or whether similar statutes already on the books have had any positive effect. There was no sober inquiry into the actual cause of these bizarre mass murders, not principally because that would jeopardize the pre-existing federalizing agenda, although that too, but because it would require seriousness of purpose and actual work, something the juvenile outlook tends to avoid. This also explains why the matter was handed off to Joe Biden. <laughs> Subtracting intent from criminal law is diversionary because, to continue with the gun control example, if we can blame the object, the gun, we can more readily ignore the actual problem, that, be, that being the person who fires it. Indeed, the very phrase gun violence, gun violence, could easily, if one is inclined to this way of thinking, be recast as finger violence. Since the gun won't work unless you use your finger, and fingers and guns have equal amounts of volition, that being none. Subtracting human volition from the definition of crime makes just as much sense as subtracting it from the gun control debate. But exactly that subtraction is what, what has been going on for decades in criminal courtrooms across America. What's surprising about the recent push to delete volition from the definition of federal crime in order to broaden it is not that it has shown up, but that it has taken progressives this long to figure out how powerful it is to move it from the defense side to the prosecution. On the defense side, it can only help the occasional drug pusher or strong arm. On the prosecution side, it can threaten us all. And yet with all that, there's another angle of this story I need to talk with you 
It's not just liberals who can be tempted to divert their gaze from the more serious underlying problem. To a lesser but still critical extent, you and I face the same temptation. The reason for this is while legal conservatives are vigilant in spotting the infectious bacteria, uh, the intent optional or jurisdictionally challenged federal statutes, we are less vigilant about keeping an eye on the petri dish in which they grow. The petri dish is dumbed down moral standards. I can't come close to giving you an overview of that in my remaining time, so I'll make only a couple of points. The decision in Skilling, the honest services case, was welcomed by most conservatives, except for those who thought, like most of the panel, and the three concurring justices, that the court didn't go far enough. The relief was understandable. Few will regret that the court narrowed the statute whose prior breadth was rife with opportunities for prosecutorial overreach. But left unanswered, because unasked, was any question about our slide toward a culture of deceit, or what role might have had, what role the law might have played in that slide. Cultural decay was on bold display in skilling an Enron spill-off rich in detail about how disingenuity and outright lying increasingly threatened not just corporate governance, but the fundamental trust without which a healthy commercial and civic life cannot exist. Yet the court whittled away the honest services statute without so much as mentioning honesty. What it means to be honest in our dealings with one another is, so it seemed to the court, just too hard to figure out. That was the gist of the court's vagueness analysis, but one must wonder. The truth the court and our society seem so determined to fudge is that people know full well when they're cheating. Employees might have been by the million, might well spend time messaging on Facebook or looking at the porn site or sneaking off to the ball game. But that such behavior is widespread scarcely shows or even suggests that anyone is confused about whether it's honest. Conservatives should be worried, not happy, that the new anchor of the court's vagueness jurisprudence is not so much the admitted difficulty in defining the cheating at which the statute was aimed, but just that, quote, everybody does it. When I was growing up, saying that everybody does it was considered less a constitutional insight than a reason to get sent to your room. <laughs> A corrupted culture is a big deal, and not just to social critics, statists, or puritanical nags. If we took all the problematic federal statutes off the books this afternoon, the most worrisome danger would remain. We take pride in saying that we are a nation of laws and not men. But the laws need men and women to enforce them. And how a culture molds those men and women makes at least as much difference to our freedom as the laws we are talking about today. If you have a Mike Mukasey or an Alex Acosta as the prosecutor, our citizens can take heart that even laws pushing the federalism envelope will be applied with good faith and decency. If you have Mike Nyfong of, of Duke LaFrost folks fame as the prosecutor, even the most basic laws, laws whose pedigree and legitimacy no one doubts can become the road to a police state Undisciplined law is a danger that rightly concerns us, now more than ever in the era of the regulatory state, and particularly of a politicized Department of Justice. But as the father of our country, the indispensable Federalist, warned in his farewell address, it is a corrupted culture, even more than a corrupted law, that most ominously threatens the survival of our freedom. First, I'd like to, to throw out kind of a general question to the members of the panel, given that each of them is a former prosecutor. This is a little bit more of a nuts and bolts question, and I ask it largely because I assume that 
many of the law students here would like to go into criminal law, either on the prosecution or, or defense side, both of which are perfectly honorable, I might uh, add. But I'd, I'd like the panelists, if they could, to reflect, given their experience, on the dynamics of prosecutions on the federal side as opposed to prosecutions on the state side. And I'm thinking mainly of crimes that could be brought by either authority, let's say ordinary local uh, drug possession and distribution crime, or I recall that uh, a few years ago we had uh, cases where there was a federal task force in the Fort Worth area to prosecute ordinary robberies of restaurants and convenience stores using the, the commerce power. Or another example might be uh, interstate uh, carjacking, where, where those can be prosecuted by state or, or federal authorities. There's a great deal of difference, at least in my impression, and I'm asking here for responses whether the panelists agree or disagree as to whether these are prosecuted state or federal, because on the federal side, we have uh, the federal sentencing guidelines. We have federal mandatory minimums where, the, for example, an ordinary drug courier uh, 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 isn't allowed, perhaps, to be sentenced below a certain level, a certain number of years, even though even if he or she is is, has only a small connection with a much larger a drug a conspiracy. Uh, and the way the federal system is now structured, you know, probation and, and parole pretty much don't exist. Uh, so that what you see is what you get on a sentence. A 20, uh, uh, they're allowed about a one-seventh credit on a sentence. So a 21-year sentence, a person will serve 18, uh, 18 years. It's not uncommon that we see uh, very ordinary federal drug prosecutions where people are getting hard time of 20, 25, or 30 years uh, in federal prison. We all pick up the local newspapers and read where some person who has been convicted of manslaughter or, or even uh, some degree of, of, of murder on the state side uh, is released after seven, eight, or, 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 or 10 years because there's more latitude. On the federal side, only the judges give out the sentences in many states, such as Texas, juries are allowed to give out the sentence and can give merciful sentences that are, that are quite low that can't be reversed on appeal. That's a long-winded question, but I wonder if any of you have any responses to uh, what it does to the criminal system, for better or for worse, where the federal authorities can come in and prosecute in a much different way and a, to a much different degree for the same crime uh, whereas the local district attorney would be much more uh, limited in his or her uh, uh, power to lead to, to, uh, out uh, justice. I think there are two aspects to it. One, the first one I would take to, in response to you is go to Alex's point about the killings and the federal government had to do something about it. I mean, I prosecuted in the state court a long time ago, and this was before all of these changes. And there was a great deal of cooperation between federal and state law enforcement, but they still understood the difference between federal and state. The federal government has the resources. They can assist, but it doesn't mean that they have to make everything federal. For instance, uh, there are different ways to do this, but US attorneys and DAs could be cross-deputized where they go into the other jurisdiction. Well, what difference does that mean? It means that you're subject then to that governing body, that is the state governing body, that is the state juries. The reality is that both state and federal prosecutors sometimes cooperate because they deliberately attempt to avoid the local jury or the local state constitution. In Pennsylvania, there's a stricter attitude or more generous to the defense on exclusionary rules. Now, I don't like expansive exclusionary rules, but the reality is I wouldn't live in Pennsylvania either. And, but it's up to the people of Pennsylvania to decide what their criminal law is. And the feds come in and they don't like it and they move it up to the national level. And when you do that, what you're doing is making things uniform. The whole point of federalism is that local police powers are different. And that goes to the second point. You know, is it up to the federal government to deal with, as Bill was talking about, this cultural rot? I agree with Bill on many things in his analysis, certainly, of mens rea and of the cultural rot. But the one thing that the federal government was clearly not given power to deal with were the moral questions. 
And these were left at the state level because the founders understood that it was going to be very difficult to get the people of Massachusetts and the people of Georgia to agree to live in the same union because they realized that they had many different attitudes. And it wasn't just over slavery. After all, many of the slave traders were in Rhode Island. It had to do with many fundamental differences. There are ways to cooperate. The problem is that there's been a loss of the concern for federalism. And Alex says, well, you know, this is probably part of the regulatory state. I agree it's part of the regulatory state. But, as Justice Scalia says, we can't protect federalism up in this court if the American people cease to value it. And the purpose of these academic discussions is to make sure that young lawyers have thought about this and hopefully value it and understand that these divisions of power are not simply arbitrary 18th century throwback things. They are the essence of how the founders of this country guaranteed the protection of our liberty for an awful long time where it has not been guaranteed in practice in other countries. So when people tell me about the practical, I know a good bit about the practical, but I also know that a lot of pragmatists have sold us down the river in many areas because of the compromises they've made. Um, I'm definitely going to respond to that a little bit. Um, uh, first of all, I, I think when uh, we talked about regulatory state, I pointed out that the solution is not to complain about the, the criminalization of the regulations, but to question whether regulation should be enacted in the first place. Um, um, secondly, um, theory matters a lot, um, but complaining without creating a solution doesn't affect change. And so the uh, point about creating a solution and focusing on what can be done is that ultimately, if you really want to have an impact, you need to make a proposal. You need to say, say realistically, how do we go from point A to point B? And that is not compromise, that is not selling down the river, that is just saying that if we are going to change things, you need to do more than complain. Uh, you need to come up with an actual proposal. Now, let me um, let me address the judge's point, if I could, because I, I think it's a really important one. Um, over the several decades, we have gotten ourselves in a real predicament because the state and the federal system are so fundamentally divergent. So here is what happens. Um, here's what happens in the streets. Someone is picked up for drug possession. Someone's picked up for a crime. And uh, the system, in essence, says, please don't do it. The state court systems do not prosecute. They don't have the resources to prosecute. Um, they say, please don't do it. Suspended sentence, they're sent home. You know, what that teaches is it's kind of okay to violate the law because you just committed a felony and you're not getting any jail time. So now you're picked up a second time. Well, now it's pretty serious. Now it's the second felony that you committed. And in the state court system, now you're looking at all of six months. You know, um, uh, well, now you commit a third felony, and now they're going to get real serious on you. Um, and even in the states that have to strike laws and others, you're still looking at a very limited amount of time. Um, prosecutors plead cases out much more quickly in state systems. And yes, as, as, as Professor Baker noted, that is the choice of the state. But the choice of the state, the, the state made that choice knowing that there's a federal safety valve. Um, and so prosecutors um, in, in Florida start out at $38,000 for, for those law students that you're going to prosecution at the state level, $38,000 a year. Um, they don't stay very long. It's not a particularly experienced area because the resources aren't there. They have two to 300 cases. Um, uh, a typical case, you spend just a few hours investigating. Um, and you just try to plead it out because you've got a backlog and you're really not going to take the trial. Um, so you're going to get about two years for that third one. Well now, now you're sort of a career criminal and the fourth time you're picked up and you happen to have a firearm, the state law enforcement says, we give up. This person's been through the system three times, we're going to take them federal. And they'll go into federal court. Uh, as a career criminal, and they'll think they're getting out. And you can just see these individuals shocked when they hear about the federal mandatory minimums, when they hear about 20 years.
They, they didn't realize that committing the law could put you in jail for that long amount of time. Um, and, and in part, that's our fault because through the state system, we have taught them that it's okay to violate the law. It's almost like I, you know, saying, please don't do it, please don't do it, you know, slap on the hand. And then eventually when they go federal, you just take a swing and punch them in the face. Um, uh, and, and so this divergence has created a problem where um, the local system has not developed at the legislative level, at the sentencing level, at the resource level to prosecute the more serious cases because they know that the federal prosecutors are there. So the question is, what is the solution? And the federal prosecutors withdrawn from that system does not provide that solution unless we're willing to have chaos. You have to address the changes in the state court system and prepare the state court system before you withdraw the federal prosecutor. When you take out the cast, you don't all of a sudden tell the person, go run an Olympic marathon. The person needs to rehabilitate their muscles, work their muscles through, and strengthen their muscles to the point that they can then you know, do what they were doing before. And so the problem with these joint task forces between the federal and the state system is whenever you have a joint task force, and we had several, they always want to go in the federal system. Um, we had cross-designated, we use cross-designation all the time. The state loved cross-designation because then you could have state prosecutors going through the federal system. And so yes, it was relying on the federal system, it was taking away the choice between the states. Um, but ultimately, when one system has been given the resources over time, you cannot simply withdraw and say, we are not going to use that system. You need to develop a plan to go from point A to point B. Let me just, if I can. Yeah, I just want to give a very short resource. And Alex, since you asked for practical uh, response, first of all, my experience as state prosecutor was nothing like what you described before. But the way to do it is, how about a U.S. attorney who stands up and says, well, we will help the state in this case, with our resources, because we've got greater resources, but it's ultimately their responsibility. There's a practical solution that doesn't require legislation. It requires U.S. attorneys standing up and saying, it's your responsibility. Can I also add, it would be nice if judges were more willing to toss these statutes. Just toss them back to Congress's lap. I, I know that judges are doing it in the best of intentions, because ultimately they know that if they throw it back in Congress's lap, they'll probably make another dog's breakfast out of it. You know, and it'll go on for another five years. They will do that as long as you keep fixing it for them, right? So just invalidate it. Unconstitutional, send it back. I think that's a really practical. <laughs> I think that's. I was about to say amen to that. Yeah. I, I think that's right on. But the district judges will do it. Yeah, the one point that I want to add here is that state courts and the administration of state justice uh, do not necessarily reflect the will and the desires of the electorate within the state. And the particular instance I have in mind is the administration of the death penalty. The death penalty has never been repealed by a referendum of the people. There was recently, just uh, last November, there was a referendum in California um, about whether California should keep the death penalty and uh, the vote of the people was that they should keep the death penalty. But the death penalty in California and in many other states is dysfunctional, not because of the will of the people, but in spite of the will of the people. And if only the federal government has a death penalty, for the government, for the federal government to use it in extreme and outrageous cases, which is the only, which is the only kind of cases in which the feds do use it, uh, in a state that does not itself has the, have the death penalty is not a frustration, but it is a vindication of the will of the people of that state. Can I respond to the judge's question? So I, I think you're getting a sense of where you prosecute may well determine how you view this allocation state to federal. So I was in New York, and we had three federal districts right adjacent to each other, Southern District, Eastern District, and District of New Jersey. And then we had a very strong DA in, in Manhattan, so we were fighting over cases all the time. I mean, um, and we needed to make our numbers to get our slice of the DOJ budget pie, right? So 
in November, I hope I'm not telling any secrets out of school, but in November they'd sit around, you know, because the end of the year is coming, we gotta get our numbers up, and we're, we're rewarded by indictments. So they'd say, you know, take all those bail jumps out of your, out of your filing cabinet, or whatever you can indict, and indict it, you know, let's get going. So we weren't given anything to the states. In fact, we were fighting tooth and nail. The first World Trade Center bombing, you're probably too young, but the first World Trade Center bombing happened, and, and um, our office, I was in the office then, um, wanted to prosecute it, but all the defendants were from New Jersey. And New Jersey said, well, you know, all the defendants are from New Jersey. And, and we had to go to justice and say, yeah, but the hole is in New York. And then we won't, because the whole was in New York. But it, it's a really different environment. Um, because the Southern District is, is sort of known for its securities work, because we're, we were over Wall Street, we were fighting tooth and nail with the DA's office for those cases. And oftentimes, we wouldn't allocate either way, we both were. Uh, so I think your experience is different, where, depending on where you are. That's so, where was <laughs> that, was, that was not my experience, and it wasn't my experience at all that in the Eastern District of Virginia, where I work, um, that we indicted uh, people so we could get a bigger share of money from DOJ. We indicted people because we had the evidence of their guilt and believed we could do that. Well, that was, my, that, was my, that was my take on it. We did the same thing, but it was pretty remarkable that in November, you know, we were reminded to get out there and I let, 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 let me let me add uh, another part of the, the, the judge's point is um, at the federal level, uh, ideally, um, you only take the most serious stuff. Um, uh, every office sets their own guidelines, internal guidelines, and those aren't public. Um, uh, you don't want a, a, a criminal to think that if they have, you know, 99 pounds of marijuana, 99 kilos, they will go to state, but if they have 101, they'll, they'll, they'll go federal. Uh, but uh, at, at least in South Florida, there's so much going on and it's such a, a massive office that um, uh, would accept, with, with, with rare exception, only the most serious of the matters uh, were, were brought at the federal level. And so you don't have, you know, I cannot recall in, in, in my entire time there a street level drug dealer being prosecuted unless they were associated with some uh, major cartel or unless it was sort of a step in in a larger uh, international investigation. I mean, uh, you weren't competing though, because correct. we have the Postal Service, which actually brings most of the cases that come to the Fed courts from the Federal Postal Inspectors Unit. Um, and they'd say, well, you know, unless you do these cases, We'll take them to Jersey or the Eastern District. And my answer and was, go ahead. Yeah, well, that was, I don't think that was our answer. I, <laughs> I could be wrong, but I, I don't think that was our answer. We got some of our That was just the line system, by the way. I wasn't the big dog, so. <laughs> it was one of the most prominent cases, not because we wrestled them away from the locals, but because the locals beat down the door saying, could you please take this? Because we had, and I'm referring particularly to one uh, program we did called Project Exile. The murder rate in Richmond was skyrocketing. People wanted something done about it. The feds have a statute, 18 U.S.C. 924C, which is a mandatory five years for committing a felony with a firearm. And once you do that, that's what you're going to get. The judge has no discretion, thank goodness, in that instance. There are many instances in which the judge Sure, it does have discretion, but not in that one. The first year after we implemented Project Exile, the murder rate in Richmond fell by 50%, and the second year it fell by another 50%. This was not against the will of the lo locals. The locals were brimming with gratitude that we had granted their request to do something about it. Bill, I question those statistics in an article. All right, so we have, a, we have a lot of people lined up with some good questions, so just a couple of uh, of, uh, of rules here, I'm going to uh, uh, I'm going to use uh, 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 privilege here to uh, exercise some affirmative action, which is that if you've already asked a question, please let all the others who have not asked a question in one of the previous panels ask, so that we can have as much participation as possible. And if you've asked more than one question already, then you need to wait till until uh, the end. And I hope I'll have time for everyone. We'll alternate. Uh, back and forth between uh, the microphones.
And please be sure you're asking a question and not making a, a speech, and things will go uh, a lot better. All right, with that, so we'll start over here. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, my name is Ben Dexter. I go to the uh, New England School of Boston. Um, I go to school part time because during the day, I work as a law enforcement officer, a local law enforcement officer. And one of the things that amazed me when I first got on, on the job, as they, as they say, was the disparity between the resources at the local and the federal level. Local VAs are running around managing cases. The first time I went to federal court and the VA got a chance to sit down and, and talk with me, it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. But as we've seen in Boston recently, do they have too many resources? In Boston, I'm, I'm referring to the case recently of Aaron Schwartz, who was the, the founder of Reddit. And uh, he was he got in trouble for, for uh, downloading academic articles from, I think it was JSTOR, was the name of the website. Um, the office in Boston, uh, one after them pretty strongly, ended up committing suicide. I'm wondering if these cases um, are, are, are evidence of, of too much resources at the federal level, and if so, uh, what do you folks think would be done to shift these resources back down to the local level? I definitely don't think it's too many resources. I think it's a bad judgment. Because um, that meant that they went without making other cases. I will tell you that, so I teach a co-teach a class with the Department of Justice. I, um, my students have a field placement at DOJ Fraud, and we do a seminar as well. And um, they are so grateful to have my students 15 hours a week because they really, really do not have the manpower that they've got a huge freeze going on. And they could, and this is a profit, I maybe it shouldn't be, but it is a profit center. They do the Medicaid and Medicare fraud. And they bring in billions of recovered fraud money back to the federal government, and yet we're not, you know, we don't have enough assistance in that office. So hopefully, I, I think it's bad judgment, maybe, but not too many resources. Let's, let me let me agree in part, and, and not disagree in part, but, but maybe tone the, 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 my, my response a little differently. Um, uh, one of the, the things you see structurally uh, within any office is, is it gets organized with specialty areas. And, and sometimes, um, for whatever reason, whether it's a state level or, or a federal level, um, you get a specialty group set up to go after A. You know, to go after, you know, lights in the face of panelists' crimes. Um, and so all of a sudden now, you get, you have to go after these particular crimes. And, 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 and so that structural issue sometimes means that you start searching for those particular crimes in a way that if, if you were to sort of step back and have a choice between A, you know, between a and B, you would say we want to prosecute B, but because you empowered this group and tasked them with finding crime A, all of a sudden you step back and you say, what did they find and, and why are we doing this? So, so there is a structural resource allocation issue that does create problems at times. Um, you know, we see this right now with the sequester where um, one of the questions is should the executive branch be given the discretion to prioritize between critical government resources and, and non-critical resources. I, I saw this morning that um, $700,000 were being spent doing a musical on um, the importance of environmentalism while they're saying we're going to lay people off. Is that really the best use of resources or not? Um, and, and, and so there is a structural resource allocation issue that sometimes exists, but for the most part, I would say that also is a question of judgment. And you better, you know, all law enforcement, whether federal or state, has a lot of authority. And as a law enforcement officer, you know, you can make someone's, you know, you can break someone's life and really ruin them with a bad charge. And, and you, it's your responsibility to, to make the right decisions, and that applies at all levels. The DOJ has a section on computer crime. My sister actually works in there. And there is this resource allocation problem which relates to the Boston case you're talking about. The one area that clearly the federal government has authority over is the internet and crime on the internet. But if you are a victim, as I recently was, of identity theft, forget it. Absolutely forget it. When you call to report the crime, you know what they tell you? Call your local police department. 
then tell me what your local police department is going to be able to do when the information was purloined from a computer in another state. So I called the Dallas office of the uh, U.S. Attorney, and one, they wouldn't let me through, and two, when I got in through a back door and I talked to the lawyer, he wanted to know who I was, he promised to call me back, and never called me back, okay? Locals have no resources to do this. The problem is that the federal government is misallocating resources. There is plenty of federal crime that raises no constitutional issues, and they're not on it. Okay, over here. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, my name is John Wood, and I'm from Georgetown Law, so I must commend uh, the representation of, of Georgetown on today's panel. I think all future panels should be composed of at least 50% Georgetown Law professors. So much for diversity. <laughs> So, so my question revolves around. <laughs> so my, my question revolves around mens rea, and so um, we, as, as as we've talked about, um, the um, legislatures have have seen the power of, of removing mens rea from criminal law, um, and the, the power it gives them to to apply that generally to everyone. So, is there any hope? Um, if we can't rely on legislators to, to add mens rea or morality back into our criminal justice system, is there a place for judges to um, read those into laws that, that don't currently say anything about That's what they're doing. The, the, traditionally, courts have done it on so-called common law crimes, and some courts have gone beyond that. And I agree with everything Bill said on the mens rea issue completely. <laughs> But the problem of mens rea is much worse at the federal level because the nature of the crimes are not intelligible to members of the jury. Tell me what a RICO is, okay? Have you ever seen a RICO? Well, first image of organized crime is some guy in a black shirt, white tie, and a fedora, I guess. But you know when you're dealing with a murder, rape, robbery, the jury understands that, they understand what the mental element is. The problem is that the federal circuits have split over even the meaning of knowing. And in many of the statutes that supposedly have a mens rea of knowing, the reality is that the courts have, have construed it in such a way that it means nothing. The reality is we have many, many strict liability prosecutions at the federal level, and that means you're convicting people without a mens rea, moral guilt, but the facts look bad, and there's an indication they must have done something bad, but that's not really proof of guilt. John and I completely agree about mens rea. I would, I would just say this to the questioner. Uh, everything in life turns out to be a choice among trade-offs. And while we might be tempted to hope that the federal judiciary would do something about the problem of mens rea that both John and I see, uh, the trade-off there is do you really want federal judges rewriting statutes. And it had been my impression that members of the federal society had some difficulties with that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just add, it may not be the judges are always totally effective either. So when they're looking at these statutes, they employ something called the public welfare doctrine. And their question is, did Congress mean for this statute to be a public welfare statute? And if so, we're going to require a non-existent mens rea. Because basically we want to, and most of these are business-oriented statutes, right? So we, we basically want an incentive for businesses to learn the regulations. So you know, who cares if they knew about them or they knew about the violation? We're trying to create the appropriate incentives. So judges are deciding, hmm, should we have a mens rea here or not? And it's really not their job, right? I, I don't think any of us think that really we should be left to have some, some one judge decide whether or not after the fact, right, after the conduct has occurred, whether or not you should have a men's right or not. So. All right, let's move on to another question. Yeah, John Cook, uh, University of Colorado. Uh, thank you for your wise remarks. Um, I wanted to discuss, obviously, Colorado recently had a prohibition of marijuana mm -hmm. uh, along Washington. And, um, you know, as a libertarian who sees over-criminalization uh, eroding the, the rule of law, I, I'm very proud of people in my state, but I'd like to hear the panel's opinions on what the outcome, if you were to guess, of this battle between Washington and Colorado and, and federal criminal laws, uh, what will happen, and then whether you think this is a good tool going forward uh, for states trying to, you know, 
roll back federal, uh, federal criminal. It's so funny history. because when you were talking about how really states should be permitted to have their own criminal norms, I was thinking assisted suicide and dope. <laughs> and, and my view is, you know, DOJ, the U.S. Attorney's Manual, I thought, had a provision in it that said we will not prosecute simple possession cases. That certainly was the case in the Southern District. Um, now, the press hasn't mentioned it, so maybe it's not still in there, but I think it's very clear that even this administration is not looking for a battle here. I, I, I would be really surprised. If because the, the medical marijuana is different, right? Because the medical marijuana, you've got a dealer, basically, a licensed dealer. But all Colorado is saying, as I understand it, is simple possession is not a crime anymore. No. And I can't see the feds. It's retail I stores. Be, pardon? Like retail stores. Oh, they're having retail stores. Yeah, okay, then I'm just informed. Wow. You know, <laughs> <laughs> they may have a crook thing going A big ring pulls up with bales of marijuana. <laughs> saying that it was illegal to move 
lottery tickets over state lines because that was a way of protecting other states that had laws against lotteries and they didn't want to allow one state to undermine the criminal laws of the other. The role of the federal government is supposed to be able to protect the states from each other in some cases like that. Unfortunately, in the lottery case, the Supreme Court decided that it was a good thing because gambling was a bad thing and that's where we started off in the whole business of the federal police power. There's, a, there's another element that I want to mention just to see if any of the panelists have a reflection on it, and that's the whole question of double jeopardy, because you have, you have dual sovereigns. You have federal and then you have state. Now, where this has come up for perfectly understandable reasons, I don't mean to be unsympathetic to this, is back in the civil rights era where you might have a local uh, civil rights prosecution criminal uh, at the state level, uh, and the jury acquits, and maybe there's some suspicion not of any kind of corruption or bribe of the jury, but that the jury was just simply racially not prepared to, uh, uh, to, uh, to convict. And then the, the feds come in and, 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 and issue a separate prosecution for the same act. Now, I'm not going to get into the legal doctrines of whether that's technically a violation of the Double Jeopardy Clause, but certainly one could argue that it's a violation of the spirit of the Double Jeopardy Clause because you have a citizen subject to two different sovereigns, commits one act, and is subject to a second prosecution after a vote. And I think this is where state sovereignty comes in. I mean, I was clerking when they, they, a case came in where it was, you know, this guy hired a killer to kidnap his eight-month pregnant wife in North Carolina. And then he took her across the border and killed her in South Carolina, you know, South Carolina, let's say, I can't remember where it was. Um, and both states wanted to go after him. One, Tried him, sentenced him to life, and then sentenced him to death. It's kind of, um, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Wow, who gets him first? Uh, you know, it's a hard issue, except that you know he did commit a crime in both states, and both states, I think, have a sovereign interest in in vindicating their their laws. Now, and that's I think it's the only, you know. Non-federalist in the room. I, I yeah, still but, think it's okay. Okay, but but there are different charges. You can only prosecute him once for murder, where the murder actually occurred. You have to prosecute him in the other state for some other crime. Kidnapping was an aggravating factor of murder. Judge, <laughs> judge, <laughs> judge the, the basis for the doctrine has to do with the sovereignty, and so in the case like the, the Oklahoma City bombing, okay. that was a crime against both sovereigns because the federal government is protecting its property and its personnel. But there's a long stretch from that to simply federal laws based on the Commerce Clause. Those are not violations against federal sovereignty. So as we've expanded federal criminal law, we've diluted and taken a doctrine that was initially justified on the basis of sovereignty, and now it means something very different. Is this the side next time? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Jesse Lemon, The Ohio State University. I did my undergrad at uh, Florida International University, so go okay. Panthers. It seems that there are two real issues here that I think we all agree are the problem. One is over-criminalization, the other is over-federalization. However, aren't some of the views that are, have been expressed on this panel the, the sort of ideas that are driving both of those? What I mean is, for example, over-criminalization. This idea that now society is somehow worse than societies before, and that somehow our generation is worse than the one before, which just simply isn't true. There's not any more corruption today than there was 100 years ago. As a matter of fact, uh, statistics will bear out that there's actually less. The second point is to uh, the over-federalization. It seems that this idea that, sure, states have power, they have police power, except when we don't like exactly what they're doing, and then the federal government should just swoop in because, of course, there are lives on the line. It seems that that's what drives uh, the federal government to overreach generally, and, and so it just seems that both of your, your views on that are sort of the problem. Thank you. I, uh, I'm going to agree with you, actually, on, on both points. Um, uh, that is what drives the, the federal government to, to swoop in, and, and the question is, is how do you, you address that? Um, because in the ideal world, the federal government should not have to swoop in and, and should not be in a position to swoop in. Um, but through a number of, of historical matters, this is where we are. 
you know, we are not going to reverse the Commerce Clause. We're not going to reverse um, the, 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 the vast number of, of, of dollars that are going to Washington without fundamental changes. So if we want fundamental change, how do we go about bringing that about? And if we don't, how do we go about addressing particular issues like uh, over-federalization that, that we currently have? But um, if I can just make one more point, there's, there, there's a deeper issue in that I, I don't think we're a worse off nation. I, I may or may not disagree with, with, with uh, 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 Bill Otis on this, but, but overall, um, you know, we, we have gone through phases. Some, some generations are, you know, a bit more loose, other generations are a bit less. Um, but, but that has been the case throughout time. Um, one of the, the issues that we have now is the, the growth of the criminal sanction. And one of the costs of the growth of the criminal sanction, when regulatory violations start becoming criminal, then the stigma attached to criminal begins to lessen. Um, and so all of a sudden, one of the costs that we're seeing with this growth of criminalization is a sense that, um, that what is truly criminal is not quite as criminal, and, and I think that is sometimes perceived as a moral decay. Um, so I, I asked the question about, um, about the supremacy clause for a reason. You know, one of the reasons to have the showdown, if as a nation we do not want drug laws, then we shouldn't have the drug laws, and, and by not actually, I think one of the costs of the Justice Department avoiding the confrontation to see a federal law from state, and I think at the end of the day it would, is giving the citizens of Colorado and California and perhaps other states a safety valve. It, well, safety valves are one of my recurring issues where um, you allow two systems to, to uh, exist in tandem um, that contradict each other. If we don't want drug laws, why do we want to provide certain states a safety valve? Let's go to court, let's say that the supremacy clause trumps, and then let's have the citizens of Colorado go to Congress and say, we want our Congress people to undo the drug laws. Let's either make them criminal or not, but let's not have these, these mixed messages uh, going back and forth. We're doing that too. Um, can I um, just respond to the premise? I don't agree that, that there, there's a lot of over-criminalization, you're right, that those are two arguably different issues, but I don't think over-criminalization is due to a perception that people are getting worse or that your generation is off the charts or whatever. I think it's really, and I think a lot of people agree with me in, in academia, that the, the over-criminalization is simply a phenomenon of Congress just deciding every time something happens that you know they want to look like they're doing something. And so they pass a statute, whether or not it's appropriate, whether or not they actually have the power to do so, and whether or not it's already on the books. Mail and wire fraud, when they started, I think were punishable by six months in prison. Now it's 20 years, 30 years, if you're involved in the federal financial institution. Why is mail fraud and wire fraud so much worse than it was 100 years ago? It's because Congress has decided um, that every time there's a crisis, the SNL crisis is when it went from five years to 20. The uh, recent crisis is when it went, I'm sorry, five years to 10 years, 10 to 20. You know, so I don't think it's, it has anything to do with the reality of how bad society is or what the, what the needs of the people are. That's one of the problems I have with it. It's, a, it's an escape valve for them to look like they're doing something. Right, well, let's, let's, let's try to catch some more questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Is this side next? Yes. Okay. Tom Griffin from Chicago, Kent. Um, my question is for Dean Costa. Um, you've described this problem of uh, local reliance on, uh, on federal prosecutors to, to take on some of the burden. And then later on, you said that you know, we're not doing any good if we don't advance some kind of concrete proposals to fix things. But at the same time, you seem to be throwing up your hands and saying, well, we don't want to upset the status quo too much. I mean, do you have any concrete ideas about how to finally break this dependence and, uh, and get states to take care of their own problems? Okay, let's, let's try to get some quick answers so we can maybe... Um, sure, and, and I actually would be fine at setting the status quo. You know, it'd be really interesting to come up with block grants where uh, Congress says, you know, we are going to take um, a certain amount of money uh, and we're going to remove it from the federal system or we're going to give it to states 
uh, so that states can fund their local law enforcement more effectively. Um, you know, uh, th there are a number of ways that we can go about um, empowering local law enforcement, um, and, and I think those are the types of situations where that, that we need to think about. So I'm not throwing up my hands at all. I'm saying, if anything, we need to think more about solutions such as block grants, uh, or maybe reducing federal taxation so that the burden on individuals uh, is, is not as great, so that states uh, or, or cities like, like Manhattan that have very, very good state attorney's offices you know, can then make the decision um, if they want to, at a local level, spend money, and if so, how they go about doing that. Okay, question over here. Uh, yes, my name is Tim Keene from Baylor University, and I just want to get the panel's input on the reenactment of the Violence Against Women Act. <laughs> <laughs> Thank It's been expanded, that's what's different about it. What's that? It's been expanded, that's what's different about it. That doesn't make it any less of it. Yeah, that's probably the only person in the room who's all for it. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of these issues this panel will reveal that it's one of these wonderful issues where people who disagree so much on every issue, like John and I, seem to totally agree on it. It's great. Question over here? Robert Goldberg. Robert Caldera, School of College of Law. I was curious, especially <laughs> you, Dana Costa, whether or not you think it's perhaps the horses out of the barn, terrible cliche, it's too late to ask whether or not the Fed should be stepping into something. And in fact, the fundamental role of federal prosecutors has changed. Back in my home state of Minnesota, we've got our U.S. Attorney, B. Todd Jones, who's now up for ATF director. And as soon as his name got out, he was being raked over the coals in the press for daring to have his office spend time on terrorism, bank fraud, and massive Ponzi schemes, and in leaving the poor state attorneys to deal with things like guns and drugs. And this is something that the state is saying, well, of course this is your business to handle. Has the fundamental role of prosecution already changed? Um, um. In part, yes, but in part, and, and I'm, I'm going to go back and agree with Professor Baker here, um, um, that is why these discussions need to be had, because ultimately the, uh, the citizens of states need to look to their state attorneys and hold their state attorneys accountable. Um, uh, and, and, and so, if we take the approach, the horses out of the barn, then we'll never bring about change. We need to talk about these issues. We need to look for ways, whether it's block grants or others, to, uh, to empower state attorneys, to empower local police. Um, and, and, and we should make clear that, that you know, this, you know, that, that we need to look for ways that, so that U.S. attorney is not the local DA, uh, should not be the local DA, um, and to the extent, for example, with these gun cases, we took them on, uh, as I said, you see 28 pictures, you say, wow, we need to do something now. We weren't doing something the week before those 28 pictures came out in the same way. So these, to the extent that they're used at the U.S. Attorney's level, should be targeted, time-limited, focused um, efforts working with local law enforcement with the understanding that after the emergency has passed, um, you then walk away and leave it to the, the locals to continue. After 9-11, the director of the FBI said, you know, we really have to cut back, we're spread too thin, and we're not concentrating on the things that we do best. That's what federalism is about. The federal government is supposed to handle those things the states can't handle. The states objected to this. Some of the DAs and AGs objected to it. They have to be made to take responsibility. The feds can't do everything. It's a matter of efficiency. If you want the country protected, then the feds have to do the things that only they can do. Okay, question. Evan Simon, Judicial Crisis Network. Uh, wondering about the federal over of corporate law, in particular the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Is that a problem? And also, is are those kind of laws being used to threaten corporations into settling for things they might not even be, might not even be a crime. That's just a quick answer, and we have them hopefully we can answer more questions. As for the latter, yes. Um, the FCPA, I mean, I 
love the FCPA, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, everybody can make their own judgment on whether it's a good idea. It, it is designed to basically say that American businesses shouldn't be getting business by bribing foreign officials to get or retain business. It did disadvantage Americans as opposed to other nationalities for a very long time. But the United States pushed very hard for an OECD treaty that many of our competing nations signed. They've now implemented their bribery statutes. And actually, the British statute is much more, much tougher. It's a strict liability statute than the US statute. Um, now, whether they enforce it or not is another question. So I think the anti-competitive thing, I think, is troubling. But I think the basic idea that we should not, it was also viewed as politically a problem for the United States to have the perception that its business were destabilizing other nations and, and buying countries um, was a problem. So whether or not you like the normative judgment, uh, the enforcement issue is been on the other point, yeah, is, yeah, okay, uh, I'll just cram this in two seconds. This, um, this is a question about really uh, self-policing of the judiciary and the DOJ. Um, having, I, I'm Mike Doherty from Atlanta, president of LabMD, and I'm um, a graduate of Michigan. Um, I have a lot of experience with state judges, and I would say now my line on that is that voting for a judge is like voting for your surgeon. I don't know the populace really has a lot of that, which is a concern. And then I see, I just left the cybersecurity conference, RSA in San Francisco, it's the largest cybersecurity. And this, this issue with Aaron Schwartz is not going to go away. And I'm very concerned about the lack of accountability. Well, you see that the White House do. Let's go ahead and ask. Well, the bottom line is, what, how do they self-police the DOJ when things like this happen? When you have a, you're going to have a, at least a generational outcry. If Sansa salt's going to happen with this issue, that's going to be a lingering loss of credibility. Well, I hope that they will join the anti-federalization um, effort that uh, certain organizations like the Heritage Society are in alliance with the National Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys. Another unlikely line uh, have undertaken. <laughs> and the ACLU and me. Okay, last <laughs> question. They only did the procedure stuff. They didn't do substance. John Roll at Constitution.org. First, to correct a miscite in uh, the previous session, the case I intended to cite was Cole, C O H L, 1875. Okay, C if you have a question, let's do it quickly, otherwise, we need to move on. Okay. Uh, would you prepare, be prepared to support a constitutional amendment to clarify the commerce and necessary and proper clauses to exclude criminal penalties? No. Not, not to exclude criminal penalties. Uh, Professor Randy Barnett, who argued the race case, has come up with his federalism uh, proposals. I think they're, you know, I don't like constitutional amendments, but Something needs to be done if it's possible. I don't know whether it's possible, but I think Randy had a pretty good proposal. All right, let me, uh, I have three uh, quick announcements, if all of you would just stay briefly for this, and then we'll, we'll go to lunch. Uh, you see these postcards out throughout there on the, on, the, uh, on the chairs, and this is important. It's about two new uh, Federal Society programs, the, uh, the SCOTUS uh, uh, cast, which is available in audio broadcast series on one side, and the other side of a practice group teleforum conference calls. These are self-explanatory, but I'd like to call them to your, your attention. They're really excellent programs, and there's an app here that can be uh, downloaded. So uh, take one of those, if you will, and uh, there may be others available if you can't, if you can't find them. Secondly, announcements, importantly, about lunch. So there's two different uh, opportunities. Um, only for those who are law students who are serious about perhaps preparing to become a law professor. There's a special lunch section, a session about preparing to become a law professor where there'll be a, a lunch a panel discussion and it's in a separate location. It's at the Thompson Conference Center in room 1.124. Now, um, the, you have a map in your packet and the Thompson Conference Center uh, is to the uh, north of 
where we are now, and it's called the Joe C. Thompson Conference Center. So if you have a smartphone with a compass, or if you can find a Boy Scout, you can figure out uh, what is the next building to the north of, 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 of this one. And again, this is only for people who are seriously interested. There will be three uh, law professors there to discuss what's involved, and so you might find it interesting if that is potentially your career path uh, now or later. And then secondly, the general uh, luncheon, again, uh, get out your compass, it's immediately to the west across East Campus Drive. Uh, it's in the E. William Doty Fine Arts Building, and it's specifically the Bass uh, Concert Hall. It's a pretty short walk, again, to the west of this building, and uh, those both will start uh, at, uh, at 1 o'clock, and I believe the session recommences at is it 2 o'clock, I believe that's right, let's see. Yes, the, the luncheon is from 12.45 to 2, and then uh, we'll be back here at 2 o'clock. Thank you. Let's thank our panel.